The average American spends 47 hours a week at work. The term work husband, work spouse, work wife is very real because we spend the majority of our waking hours actually at work with coworkers rather than at home with friends and family. And is this quality time that we spend? In fact, no, it's not. According to Gallup, 70% of adults who work in the American labor force are not engaged in their work. They're bored and counting down the hours until quitting time. To give us a sense of this scale, a few years ago I met this guy, Jonah Peretti. Jonah understood that there was this whole consumer base that he could tap with kind of buzzy media. And he founded a company to do just that called BuzzFeed. So this is the place where you go for such hard hitting action news like <laughs> top 10 photos of basset hounds running, <laughs> which is actually one of the articles and super cute. And Jonah over the years since 2006 has built an empire. Now, what is this consumer base, this segment of the population that he's tapped into in order to build this empire? The Board at Work Network. Mm -hmm. So if the vast majority of adults who are at work are bored, does that mean that the vast majority of those who work at our Jewish nonprofits are not engaged? Are they bored at work? Are they on BuzzFeed? And what does this mean for our Jewish community? We live in a world of choice, where people can do most anything from most anywhere. We need to build a Jewish community where people choose to work at our organizations because they're great places to work, because people can come there and maximize their potential and really thrive. Work doesn't have to be punishment. Work can be holy and fulfilling and engaging. How might we make it so? And perhaps we can look to our tradition to give us some breadcrumbs, some hints of how we might be able to do that. After all, the rabbis were not only wise, they were managers. The Beit Midrash was a lab. It was a startup. It was a spiritual workshop. So what values infused that entity that enabled students and teachers to maximize their potential and innovate in such an exciting way? If the rabbis were to design a modern workplace, what would it look like? I wonder if it would have several key values, including one, humility. Our tradition teaches us, da lifnei mi atahomed, know before whom you stand. Know that you are part of something greater. The rabbis knew that they were but a link in a long chain of history and tradition, and their work did not start and would not end with them. The work was greater than themselves. We get subtle hints of this value of humility that infused a lot of what the rabbis did with some clues. For example, even though the rabbis were masters at their craft, true scholars, they were called Talmidei Chachamim, wise students, because there was always more learning to be done. You weren't done learning. And the single most important attribute of any leader and any great organization is his ability to self-reflect, which comes from humility. The rabbis understood that and infused that with everything that they did. And yet, too often, we think and lionize a single hero leader and forget this truism that humility is at the core of some of our greatest accomplishments and that success, in fact, is a collective endeavor. A second value that the rabbis would have infused and baked into a modern day workplace is what we'll call a, having a charitable assumption, thinking of the best of people. In Pirkei Avot, we are taught that every person should dan et kol adam We should judge a person favorably and give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, we all walk through life with our own baggage. On the outside, things may look fine. On the inside, we may be carrying pain, sadness, despair, suffering. What would it look like if our organizations embodied this element of a charitable assumption? What kind of trust, empathy, kindness would it build? In fact, we see from different examples in the business world and organizations that this foundational value can be very powerful. Danny Meyer, a restaurant entrepreneur most famous for building Shake Shack, a kind of a fast, casual, dinery kind of place, has built an entire empire on a very simple principle. Happy employees equal happy customers. 
And he believes that no matter where you are in his organization, whether you're a busboy or a chef, he invests in you so that you are able to carry that forward into the customer and delight them. One of the characteristics that he looks for in a manager is having a charitable mindset. That means thinking the best of people. The way that Danny describes it is having the back of the customer, really being on their side. Because he always wants a manager to not take a defensive stance when somebody comes and lodges a complaint. Now, Danny has been able to literally build an empire in an industry, restaurants, that has the highest failure rate and the lowest margins. So it seems to be working. And in fact, having a charitable assumption is something that is a management principle. So within management science, there's something called the theory X and the theory Y of management. Theory X posits that people are inherently not motivated. If you don't give them a short leash, they're going to take advantage of you, and they're going to misbehave. Theory Y posits exactly the opposite. They say, no, people are inherently good. And given the right elements, they're going to thrive. They want to do a good job for you. They're inherently motivated. And your job as the manager is to really have the wind at their back. It seems that the rabbis would have been more of a theory why kind of manager. They understood that the people who came to the Beit Midrash and the people who are motivated to do their best work are attracted to some of the most meaty problems. And it's up to us to create that kind of environment where people can thrive. A third and final value that perhaps would have been baked into any modern workplace environment designed by the rabbis is a commitment to curiosity. Ours is a tradition of asking questions, and the rabbis literally spent an entire lifetime and generations, therefore, la forba ver forba, to really turn over and turn over all of our texts, looking at every word, every vowel, every syllable, and building upon it in a way that led to a very graceful evolution over time. In fact, it's these little increments of progress that have indeed, over time, led to paradigm shifts. And so it's this striving, this commitment to ask questions, this inherent need for innovation, for improvement, and for adapting to change is a key to organizational success as well. There are organizations that have innovated and have rewarded themselves handsomely than some, and there are some who have not bobbed and weaved through time. Now, one example of an organization that stopped innovating but started in a very interesting place is Sears. Sears was founded in the 1880s by Sears and Roebuck as a catalog, and they housed and clothed and provided for a lot of generations of Americans through this catalog, very innovative for the time. And they did very, very well, and in 1925 opened their first department store because that was the age of the department store, and continued to do very well with this whole brick and mortar kind of um, strategy. And in 1973, they reached an acme of sorts with the building of the then tallest building, the Sears Tower but they stopped innovating. So what Sears didn't understand was that with time and different changing elements like technology, there was an increasing appetite for a different kind of catalog, one that was based on the internet. Amazon recognized this. But Sears continued its bricks and mortar kind of strategy and is now bleeding money and letting people go left, right, and center. Now on the flip side, you have a company like American Express, which actually has adapted to change in a very interesting way. American Express was founded in the, in the mid-1850s. As the gold rush was happening in the, in the westward expansion, there was a need for curious courier services between east and west. And American Express was one of those companies that filled those needs. And what ended up happening is they shuttled stock certificates and different notes for banks with far-flung branches. From there, they entered the financial services industry. They started with the money order, traveler's checks, they founded a travel business, in fact. And in the mid-1950s, they essentially sent a sonic boom to the financial services industry with, the, with a charge card. A linchpin of the rabbi's work was this commitment to curiosity, to turning it and turning it. And any workplace that would be founded by them, I posit, would have this commitment. After all, the most talented people want to work on meaty problems, and they want the latitude to be able to take risk. Now, in my organization, we spend a lot of time thinking about what people need to learn and grow and feel fulfilled in their work. And earlier this year, we did a piece of, work, a piece of research. And we asked, are Jewish organizations great places to work? No, we're not. In the next five years, nearly half of the people working in our Jewish organizations want to leave. 
Take that in for a second. Nearly half of the room here tonight and anyone else watching this talk in the future will want to leave our sector in the next five years. How can we build a sustainable Jewish community if the people who make up our central nervous system don't want to be there? They're not engaged. They're already on BuzzFeed. <laughs> what does that say about our community? Why do we spend so much time thinking about the programs and services we deliver and the buildings we erect rather than the teams of people who are actually delivering those programs and bringing those buildings to life? One of our most controversial and wisest of sages of the Talmud, Rabban Gamliel, had a whole laundry list of qualifications that he required of any student of his in the Beit Midrash. And there was one that carried over and lived on after him. And that was that any students who learn at the Beit Midrash need to have their insides match their outsides. Tocho kivaru. We need to build a Jewish community that is the same on the inside and the outside. We need a Jewish community that is vibrant. In order to do that, we need to embody the values that we hold most dear. So I ask you, does your organization's insides match its outsides? <laughs>